Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma. Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, The Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. To the brightness within you and the truth that is rooted within me. Hi and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with The Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. Today is Memorial Day Celebration 143. And our call-in number is 646-200-4169. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, Michael. Hello, Hello Michael. Oh, there I'm he is. Here. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. Glad you're here. We're going to be getting on the road tomorrow, and uh, it'll be in just in time. We're starting to get cold weather in the Ozark, so... It's a little chilly here today. It's only about 50 degrees, and it seems very cold compared to what it's been. But anyway, we're delighted to be sharing with you the Mind Shifters tools that we teach. And uh, speaking of that, we're going to be in Greensboro, North Carolina, starting Sunday, doing a free series of workshops Sunday afternoon, Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. And then we'll be doing Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing on Saturday. So if anybody's in the area... Please come and join us. We'd love to see you. You can download a flyer from the website, website, www.whyagain.com. Whyagain.com is our site. Memorial Day is something we bring up every day because we're committed to ending war on planet Earth, to bringing a state of peace to our globe. And what that means is that we're going to have to find enough people who are willing to forgive, to heal all hostility and fear in themselves and arrive at a place where being incapable of hostility or fear, they will also be incapable of war. And we're not going to probably get everybody on the planet to be making that shift anytime in the next day or two, but if we can get enough people who are willing to do the work required to forgive hostility and fear in themselves, then we're going to change the dynamic of war on planet Earth. And that's what we're here to do. If you're not familiar with the forgiveness conversation that we're speaking of, again, go to the website, whyagain.com. On the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says Download Worksheets. First four links will explain all about the Aramaic forgiveness process. Nothing to do with me letting you off the hook if I'm in some form of hostility or fear, but rather a tool with which I go inside myself and remove my hostility and fear. And that's all explained in the first four links under that uh, download links site or section on the website. And Jeannie, thank you for the awesome task that you've done of taking on that website and making it such an awesome place for people to gather tools and do their work. Do we have uh, Dr. Tim with us today? Is, uh, Is David with us? David's with us. Tim is not on today. And how is Dr. David? I'm doing very well, Michael. Uh, As you mentioned about the weather shifting for you, it shifted here a little bit. And uh, I understand that up in Chicago they're having some really interesting weather. So, you know, it does it every time at this time of year. Every year it changes like this. So uh, it has gotten a little bit cooler here. And... uh, I'm I'm doing well today. I'm encouraging and inviting people to call in and to uh, ask some questions today so that we can uh, support them. You know, as you you mentioned 
that this is the Mind Shifters radio and the Mind Shifters group. The whole purpose of this is to create a space for people to shift what goes on in their mind. And the most effective way that I've been able to do that in my mind is to do the work on a daily, consistent basis. And at the same time, uh, ask some questions and challenge what it is that I believe and what it is that uh, I perceive of going on and through that action well, then I have the opportunity in order to shift. So I invite the callers to be in uh, to call in today and or in the chat room. Well, we're certainly blessed to have the opportunity to do what we're doing in learning this internal process of forgiveness and extending it to others. Our workshops in uh, in Greensville, Greensboro, pardon me, next week. And then following up, you can check our website. We'll be touring Florida this winter. 99% of them are offered free. And the reason they're free is we're committed to putting these tools into people's hands. So we're delighted to have this opportunity to do Mind Shifters Radio. And we thank Carol for that and uh, for for helping us to get set up to uh, to begin this show to be able to offer support to people all around the globe. And so if you have a question or a thought for us, our call-in number is 646-200-4169. Do we have any callers, Shini, or any questions on the chat room? My connection over here is slower. No, there's no hands up and no conversation in the chat room. Okay, well then we'll just uh, move into the topic of forgiveness and uh, and the the tools that we teach for moving out of the space of hostility or fear and moving into the space of an actual human life. And of course, when we ask people to define a human life, it's a difficult thing to do. But there's an easy way to have an experience of it. And experience is far more than words and definitions. And all you have to do is hold a newborn child to know exactly what a human life is. And, and I'd invite you just right now, if you've never done that or if you have, just close your eyes for a moment and imagine taking a newborn into your hands and really looking into the eyes of that newborn and get a sense of the energy of that being. That's a human life. That's what we are here to express and experience, I would offer, in our world, individually and collectively. And that's what we're here to support you in doing. And we don't do it by getting other people around us to change because we have some form of hostility or fear going on in us. We do it by changing the root of the hostility and fear that each of us experiences. And, and of course, the question becomes, well, why do we experience it? Well, it's pretty simple. We experience it because it's there. And once you recognize that, once you take responsibility for that, then you have the opportunity to start to change your experience. You have the opportunity to start to change whatever is in you that's unlike the active presence of love. And in so doing, you get to live a human life. And we're able to do that. Literally, we can come to the point where we live in that newborn space, 24-7, 365. Of course, there's always somebody that's got something going on that we don't like. And we tend to blame that somebody for our upset. And our offering to you is that your upset hasn't got to do with what somebody else is doing. It's got to do with the content of your own mind. And forgiveness is how you remove that content. And I'm wondering... Jeannie, if uh, if um, Miss Sandra is back with us, I think there was probably more conversation for us to have with her from the last couple of days. Is Sandra there? Has uh, she got her hand up by chance? Nobody has their hand up. And Sandra, if you are on there, I, I don't remember what your phone number is, so if you would press 1, it would let me know, and I'll turn you on. We would love to chat with you more about this whole idea of bodies and energy systems and uh, recognizing that we are not a body, we do not have a body. Our mind makes a picture called a body 
and it's an overlay that we put on top of something that isn't what we think it is or isn't what it appears to be. And so the idea of this work is to come to the point where we get to experience who we really are, how we really operate, and recognize that relative to our energy systems, there are two qualities of energy. There's that which builds it up and that which tears it down. Forgiveness is how you remove. It's the delete key for the teardown energy. It's how you get back to the active state of a human life, the active presence of love. And our work is that of seeing that our relationships are really a gift. Our relationships give us the opportunity to a law called the law of resonance to look at everything we carry around with us. You know, most everyone uses language that goes along the lines of, you know, you made me angry, you made me sad, you made me afraid, you made me this. But we invite you to notice if you've been through a particular form of anger or frustration or hostility or fear, 87 different times with 42 different people, you're the only one that was there every time. The content of your mind is about you. It's not about them. And forgiveness is how you change it. And when you delve inside of yourself and you look beneath the surface, you know, we all uh, know how a, a, an iceberg appears in the water. You see about 5% on top and 95% down below. You don't know what's there because you can't see there. Well, in the ancient Aramaic language, they spoke of a place in the human psyche called the heart. And for almost 2,000 years, we have not been able to translate that word heart. And the word heart, properly translated, we now understand since the unconscious has been rediscovered in the West, and you know it's interesting, Freud got a Nobel Prize for discovering the unconscious. In the Aramaic, they knew about it thousands of years ago. So Freud no more discovered it than flying in the air. He did rediscover it, and with his rediscovery, we all of a sudden had the brain cells to recognize that when they said things like, take care of the heart, for out of it are the issues in life, and you'll notice they didn't say take care of the head or take care of the other guy, they said, take care of the heart. What they were saying was, take care of what is in your own dissociated or unconscious mind. Because out of that come the issues that you get to experience in your life. And if you don't like what you're feeling and you don't like what you're experiencing, you look at the 5% that you can see and you say, well, you know, obviously this doesn't have to do with me. It must be somebody else's. When they said in the Aramaic, you must forgive from your heart the wrongs of your brother, that wasn't a bleeding heart statement that you let them off the hook for what you're feeling and you do it sincerely. That's not what that meant in Aramaic. In the Aramaic language, forgive from your heart means you've got to remove from your dissociated mind, from your internal self, that which you are using to build an image called the body of your brother. And when you build that image called the body of your brother, then you are sure that they must be the problem because you can see how it's coming from and attached to them. And that whole image is an illusion. It's a 3D projection from brain cells. And so when we deny ownership for what's going on in us, we dissociate from what's going on in us. And that dissociation creates this unconscious condition. It creates a barrier and we can't see below the barrier until we're willing to open the barrier. In the ancient Aramaic, the barrier was called the veil. And you'll remember they said, the veil of the temple must be rent in twain. They were not talking about a purple curtain in the church. They were talking your temple is your body-mind unit, your energy system. They know it wasn't a body. So they didn't say the veil of the body must be rent in twain, but your temple, your dwelling place. And you must open that veil to look at what's beneath the surface in your dissociated states and out of which you make up all kinds of pictures to blame everybody else for. Now, of course, we all look and we all know that when I saw that they did it to me and it was their fault, I know because I could see it that that's true. But a good way to start to, you know, kind of quiz yourself on that in terms of looking at truth is to just ask yourself if anybody has ever accused you of saying something that you absolutely never said, of doing something that you certainly did not do. And, of course, everybody 
gives a laugh on that one and says, yeah, boy, I've been there, done that one too many times. Now, you know that that person is living in an hallucination, that their mind is fabricating your body, doing things it didn't do, saying things it didn't say. Now, I ask you to observe just pick one instance where somebody accused you of saying and doing something you didn't say or do. And notice the condition that their mind was in when they did that. Notice 100% of the time when somebody's in in that hallucination that they were in some form of hostility or fear. And they believe the same thing you believe, that the body that's showing up in their mind that they call you really did do those things to them and say those things. And the truth is, It's all an inside job. Forgiveness allows us to collapse the projections from the dissociated mind. Forgiveness allows us to open the veil of the temple and begin to see what's underneath the surface that needs to be changed. It's the tool with which you go inside yourself and delete the hostilities and fears that leave you living in a hallucinogenic world where you see things It never happened. You hear things that weren't said. The indicator that you're living in an hallucination is some form of hostility or fear. And it's time for us to undo it. It's time for us to get rid of that hostility and fear. Forgiveness is how you do it. It has nothing to do with I forgive you because I have hostility or fear. When I let you off the hook for what's going on inside of me, I'm doing a Greek act called pardoning. When I forgive, I'm going inside myself and removing the root of my hostility or fear. That's what we're here to invite you to do. Jeannie, questions, callers, comments in the chat room? So everybody's just listening. Call in number okay. 200-4169 and press 1 to put you in queue for comments or questions. Cool. Is Dr. Kim with us yet? No, and David has left. Oh, okay. Well, I know that uh, Dr. Tim was, um, uh, you know, with our change of times, he had some things to reschedule, so he'll be able to be with us more regularly. So he's probably in the in the midst of his uh, noon meeting, and uh, we'll probably come in a little bit later. So we would love to hear your questions or your thoughts. Six hundred. Pardon me. Six four six. Two hundred four one six nine. Call us. Share with us your concerns, your thoughts. What's going on in your world? How we have a hand up. Oh, cool. Let's listen. All right. Area code 941, you're on the air. Hi, uh, Jeannie. Hi, Michael. This is Marie in Florida. How are you? We are well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. I'm listening to you. And since um, there's no other callers in line, I wanted to... Uh, uh, provide some thoughts here and uh, according to what you're saying um, I know that I'm doing my best to do my work my own personal work when and and I was thinking because you address everything so beautifully how you could address that whenever I talk to first talk to people about okay there's other ways to deal with you blaming other people, and then this and that happens in your life, all of a sudden it's shut down. It's like, well, you know, this is not how I want to deal with it. And um, I have observed that it's like a recurring pattern for many people whenever I or there is a situation that triggers them an uncomfortable um, situation or way of living, and you say, well... There is a better way to address that, and here it is. You know, this is how you can address this. Automatically, you shut down. It's like, well, you know, I'm not interested or whatever they have uh, in mind that they all of a sudden have to do that is more important than addressing this situation. I would like to know on your perspective, if you can convey that to uh, the audience, how to deal with this issue. Well, Marie, I, I'm delighted that you're on the call with that question. And, you know, in the Aramaic language, and there, there's so many things that have been mistranslated from the Aramaic when it came through the Greek translations. 
In fact, Karl Marx uh, is quoted as saying that if you change the meaning of a culture's words, you can destroy the culture. And so when you look at the ancient Aramaic idea of a thing called Satan, Satan has been made this external force, something outside of us that's out to get us a dude in the red suit, a tail, and a pitchfork. And you think of all the images, and you'll see the Greek artists and their horrific imaginations based upon their terror of their gods and the way their gods were going to punish them. And that was all brought into the teachings of Yeshua. But in Aramaic, the word Satan is not an uppercase word. It is not the name of a creature. The word Satan means the resistor, one who misleads. Now, nobody wants to accept that, that that it's an internal process, because somehow they're stuck with a terrorized belief. They've been terrorized into believing into some creature outside of themselves. And if they don't believe that, they're really in trouble. And, you know, in 40 years, I've worked with thousands and thousands of people, and I've never met anybody that met that creature that is described and used to terrorize people. But I have met thousands of people who are trapped in their resistance. And the second part of the definition of Satan in Aramaic is one who misleads. So when I'm stuck in my hallucination, I'm being misled into believing that there is such a thing as a body That body is outside myself, and they're the ones who did it to me. And so you've got to, you know, Yeshua talked about you had to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, which meant you have to have the brain cells. So the starting point is to assist someone in building the brain cells for living and functioning differently than the world does. And, you know, I I like to use an example of imagine that we have a – a pound of hamburger on a plate on the floor in the kitchen, and we have an ounce of gold. And we bring a dog into the room. We bring two dogs. We bring ten dogs. We bring a hundred, a thousand dogs. A thousand dogs have a choice. They could go over and pick up the ounce of gold, or they could go over and start chewing on the hamburger. Yes. Now, you'll notice that of the thousand dogs that come in the room, there will not be one that will go over and pick up the ounce of gold off of the plate. Why not? because they don't have the brain cells for recognizing the value of the ounce of gold. They could go out and buy 1,500 pounds of hamburger with that ounce of gold, but they'll slop down the pound of hamburger that's sitting in front of them because that's all they understand. That's all they have the brain cells for. You know, there's an old saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's true. But you can make them them thirsty. And the way you make them thirsty is by inviting them to – question everything they believe, inviting them to be willing to begin to build the brain cells to look at things differently. And when they start to look at things differently and start seeing differently, then they'll have driven a wedge into the resistor. They'll start to take away the resistor's power over them. And so by presenting the material and assisting people to build the brain cells, and I've seen it take 10 years for somebody to have the brain cells to come back and go, what was that you said? Tell me that again. I remember okay. one, one particular case. We had a woman that uh, <clears throat> had done a week of workshops, bought a book, bought some CDs, in the, or uh, back then it was cassette tapes, and put them on her bookshelf. And literally 10 years later, she called me in a panic. She said, Michael, I, I, when's the next intensive? I need to come to one of your workshops. I was like, whoa, wait a minute, what's happening? Well, I, you know, I'm in the middle of a divorce. My life is terrible, and, and I was leaning over, and your book fell off the bookshelf and hit me in the head, and I sat down and read it. And then all of a sudden, I hear what you said to me 10 years ago that I wasn't ready to hear. Her life experience had given her a chance to take the brain cells that she built in those workshops and start to bring them to fruition, to start to bring them into uh, to expression in her mind. And... I mean, it was after 10 years of being away from the work, it was such an emergency. It's like, well, well, but but certainly you've got an intensive starting this weekend. I have to get there right now. It's like, well, unfortunately, no. Uh, It's going to be a couple of months. And and she did show up that summer and did some awesome work. But 10 years earlier, no brain cells, no motivation, no willingness to look. There is this wonderful gift that we're given by the creator. It's called pain. 
Now, in a sense, when I say given to us by the Creator, what I mean is it's built into our structure. It's not that the Creator causes this pain. It's built into our structure that when we go off task, when we go off mark, what happens is a part of our energy system, because of what we're putting into it, says, ouch, that hurts. And pain has this absolutely awesome, wonderful purpose. It makes our ears grow. It gets us to the point where we're willing to listen. And so sometimes you just have to sit back, breathe. I remember when I first started doing this work, you know, everybody I spoke to had to get it. And now I realize it's not my job that everybody get it. My job is to help people to build the brain cells, to keep putting it out there until people are ready to go, oh, that ounce of gold on the plate. Tell me about it. <laughs> I really would like to chow down on that hamburger, but that ounce of gold, you know, I'm starting to wonder what it's really all about. And that's when people start to question, then there's an opening to start to bring them something different. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And then I recall when I was at the uh, one of your intensive and you said you have to learn to duck or to hold a mirror. <laughs> And sometimes uh, uh, what I uh, experience is uh, when I present an alternative, somebody calls me and they're in pain, they're crying, and I'm listening because, you know, there's some venting that they have to do. And then after I say, well, uh, are you prepared to look at another alternative? And they're like, no, (laughs) that's how the world works. And if I uh, um, uh, add on like, well, Maybe you're you're kind of stuck in your story, and there's other ways to see it, and other ways to uh, address that. Are you prepared to do that? And it's like, no, that's how the world works, and I'm not prepared. Um, and then it brings a little bit of uh, not frustration, but, but like, oh, I would so much love to tell you there's so many different ways to address this, so that you would not be in so much pain for something that you think is the end of the world, but you just addressed it. It's like, you know, when you're not ready, I guess when some people are not ready, they're just not ready, and then planting the seed and hope that it's going to grow. Well, you go back to Yeshua 2,000 years ago, and he says, there are so many things I would say to you, but you can't hear them yet. People don't have that the brain cells. So true. And they can't hear them before they build the brain cells. And... Part of the challenge in that is that there are so many things in most people that go against them having the brain cells. We've been brainwashed with so much false information that that adds another layer and another level of difficulty to the process because we've been taught things that simply aren't true. We've been taught a whole pack of lies. And so... It's not until we wake up and start to uh, build those brain cells and understand differently that things begin to change. That and is it's absolutely true. Important. And and when this uh, situation arises, what it brings up for me is like what I have learned and what I do apply and when I do my work and it works, I'm so excited that I want everybody to benefit from it and I get kind of frustration back because, no, they're not ready and they don't want to hear it and they're not prepared to hear it. And uh, I, I, this is additional work that I know that I have to work on. I wish one day I'll be uh, frustration-free. <laughs> but I'm still doing my worksheets. Well, that's that's what I had to say. So I thank you very much for um, the explanation that you gave, and I hope that it helps other people also to understand that you know there are better alternatives out there. Um, not everybody is prepared at this very particular point to uh, uh, jump into that and do their work, and uh, there's probably a, a space where. Um, I can just be in a loving space and hearing their their pain and uh, let them vent, and then I'll maybe address that later when they're in a better uh, uh, mental position where they're able to receive uh, uh, better knowledge than what they are been tra- they have been trapped in at the time they they are in pain. You, you said something. Uh, wonderful in in one of your DVDs 
is that um you know when somebody in is in pain try to try to tell them uh I, I don't know exactly how you said that, but try to them that, tell them that uh, there's other alternatives and off with your head because, no, they they want to stay in that area where they're very negative and they feed on that and they want to vent. So it's uh, the, the subtle, um, um, I guess, that I will, the subtlety that I will uh, get uh, more and more confident with when I'm in front of somebody uh, where I can tell, okay, well, do you want to just tell your story or you're coachable and want to hear about something better that you can choose from? And uh, that's part of my growth. Well, thank you, Michael. Michael. And, you know, if if you uh, if we as teachers have a place in us that holds frustration and or, you know, we feel like we're not valued, et cetera, et cetera, then that's going to be our next piece of work. That'll be my next worksheet. If somebody refuses it, disses it, and says, oh, that's just garbage, you know, forget about that, uh, then if that gives me the opportunity to look at my frustration, then that will be my opportunity to learn to forgive that frustration in me. And right. You know, it's like life is just filled with opportunities. And it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it is. It's an ongoing thing, ongoing work, and it's like uh, it's like I heard you say, well, uh, to one similar question from somebody once, and you said, well, you know, it's like taking your shower. You're pretty much going to have to take your shower for the rest, every day for the rest of your life, right? You're going to do your work forever. Yeah, and you know, there's there's um, the thing we we kind of call it the eighth beatitude crew. And if you look at the eighth beatitude, um, it it speaks of first of all in the beatitudes, we're told by the Greeks that it said blessed are they, and it doesn't say anything that resembles blessed are they. What it says is a latent neural structure implanted by the Creator to guide you to happiness and well-being becomes your conscious possession. You who so that's the word blessed are they. So then what the eighth beatitude says, you who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And what it says in, in the Greek translation is for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in Aramaic, what he's inviting people to do with that eighth beatitude, it comes right after the one that speaks about peacemakers. And in Aramaic, the peacemakers are those to work effectively to produce the peace and understanding under in accord with God's will. And that's how we stand in the place of what it says is they will be the offspring or the children of God. But then this next beatitude, when you prematurely bring something up for people, you know, that they're just not ready to deal with, you know, when you present truth to someone who's in blockage of truth, their stress level is going to go up sometimes through the roof. That's when they want to take off somebody's head. And so Yeshua recognizing that, okay, be prepared for this. If you're going to do your work, if you're going to teach the work, here's one of the things that you'll get to do. You'll get to have people who will want to take off your head. The word he used, the Greeks used there is persecuted for the sake of righteousness. What does that mean? For one who is offering people truth, the person in block of truth has their stress go up, and you basically, uh, Marie, have to pace the level at which you present information to people. If you give them too much too fast, you know, ultimately what we're asking somebody to do in claiming a human life is we're asking people to look at every rage, every grief, every fear, every pain, every trauma, every unresolved issue of not only their own lives, but of their whole bloodline. That's what we're ultimately asking people to look into. We're saying, are you willing to go in here? Because, you know, what your great-grandmother didn't resolve energetically, frequency-wise, was passed down to you. And so and there's, a, there's an awesome video you can Google. Actually, there's a link I think Jeannie's put on the website called The Ghost in Your Genes, where the scientists are even discovering this in the Aramaic. They said the sins of the fathers will be passed into three and four generations. 
what he's saying there, and that's not some kind of punishment thing, and the word sin is an archery term. It just means that an energy that's off the mark. So when we engage in something, we holographically store that in every cell, including the sperm and the egg, and when we conceive a child tomorrow, that child would have in its structure every thought we've ever thought, every feeling we've ever felt, every reality we've ever dealt with, not dealt with, pardon me, the ones that have been unresolved. And so what he's saying here is be aware that you're asking people to, to face something, especially someone who's never faced anything before, to face something huge in their lives and in their bloodline. It's a major, major request that we're making of people. And as you paste the way that you present, you know, there would be some people who will just be right there and gobble it up. I mean, they're on it and they're going to do it right there on the spot. And other people are going to, as, as uh, you said, they want to take your head off. However, if you choose to keep doing the work of the frustration, the pain at people not hearing it, and having people spit back at you, then what happens is you enter deeper and deeper into, and the, and the Greeks translated, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In Aramaic, what it said is, theirs is the community of love. So you enter deeper into the community of love when you present as love the opportunity for people to deal with what they haven't dealt with. And so that's all part of the process. That's what we're looking to do. That is so wonderful what you're saying, and I, I hope the audience benefits from it like as they benefit from every radio show that you do have. And I do, certainly do. And when I can attend live, I um, I go in, onto, into your website and do the replays. And um, as you were talking, it brought up something for me uh, that that was uh, um, has been very... Uh, reoccurring in my life is that um, in my field of, of business, my my day to day business where I get my livelihood from, um, right. I um, I observe that um, I have a, a very good intuition, perception, and visionary. And whenever I would say, well, you know, this this place here is the next place where people will gather together. And I have encountered that countless times in my personal life where, well, that's not what people like, but what what whoever I'm addressing to is saying, well, today that's not the trend. And if I say, well, that's going to be the trend of tomorrow, and the tomorrow might be just in a few months down the road or the next year, not like decades further, um, I uh, often was like, well, I discard whatever you're saying because it makes no sense. And I just ducked <laughs> and stayed there. Um, and, and eventually I found out, like, well, <laughs> that was the new avenue. And I was, not the question I was right, but I was perceiving it right. And it ties to what you're saying is, like, uh, it, when people are not prepared, then this is something that I have to work with in me, is that uh, I have to just um, uh, face that's the, the process and they will be prepared later and just uh, keep doing what I'm doing and believing in it and uh, doing my work, and, and it unfolds beautifully eventually without adding the uh, condiment of uh, frustration. Well, I thank you for that. Awesome. Well, I'm delighted to uh, have you on our team. I am delighted to be on your team. Uh, I am uh, working toward uh, getting... Uh, to be, be presenting in Sarasota, and we'll certainly keep you posted as soon as that unfolds and happens. Thank you so much, Michael. You have a blessed day. All right. I love you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye. Jeannie, anything happening in the chat room? Any other uh, questions? Nothing. There's nothing going on in the chat room. Uh, David has rejoined us. Did you say David was back? Yes. Couldn't quite hear you. Was that a yes, sweetie? Yes. Oh, cool. Well, David, do you have anything to share with us today? Oh, I do. I was just working and getting my phone off of mute. It was great to hear Marie's voice, and I was reminded that, you know, she's taking her work to a new level. 
uh, after being at the teacher's training and then doing the intuitive training. And what's so important is the whole idea is we keep talking about is to apply it. It's one thing to hear something and get an intellectual understanding and to agree with it and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense, until five minutes later, then the mind, you know, it's like, well, what was it we were talking about? It? How do I put this, how do I apply this in my life? And I was talking with a friend last night, and uh, she was having this challenge uh, about, how do you do that? How do you do that? And I wanted to tell her all of the above. You know, how do you, how do you hold the space of love? How do you be love when other people are in their stuff? As you were talking about the resistor uh, and the uh, defensiveness with all of it, and that is a challenge. And sometimes it is from day to day, hour to hour, and minute to minute. And um, you know, people have heard me talk about. It for the past several weeks, for me especially, a lot of times it's from minute to minute. And uh, uh, so it's great to hear Marie and the other folks to to participate in in applying it in the life. And uh, that is just so key. You know, we can't have any knowledge of anything until we have the experience of it. That's my take with it anyway. Well, it certainly is a process, and it is one that, uh, as each of us chooses to engage, we get to move to deeper and deeper levels of understanding, and people will, will speak about, well, you know, gee, I've been doing this for two years or five years or ten years. Like, shouldn't I be finished yet? Well, when you recognize that this so-called body-mind unit is a storage device and the complexity that it has... And what it carries in terms of generational content is a hundred billion times as powerful and intricate as the best supercomputer on the planet. And I don't know about anybody else and how many hours you spent learning to operate your basic laptop, but when it comes to living a human life and living out of the presence of our true being, it's a hundred billion times more complex. And yes, it's a process, and yes, it takes time. And I've been at this work for 40 years, and if you're not willing to dedicate some time, well, maybe this isn't for you. But I've been working for it, at it for about 40 years, and I certainly wouldn't start to claim to be finished yet. And people... I've had people say, well, gee, if you can't do it in that time period, then it obviously can't be done. It's like, well, you know, if I look relatively, uh, the awesomeness of life today compared to 40 years ago, there's just no comparison. And the complexities and the depth of what needs to be addressed in this learning process of, and, 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 and it's not even so much just the learning process, But, you know, as we've been processing the last couple of weeks, David, the unlearning, the undoing of what never belongs so that true learning can take place, it's it's huge. It's huge. And so it is a lifetime process for sure. So is there anything exciting happening in Louisville at this moment? Um, Well, you know what, there's... uh, there's, I'm actually out doing an errand with uh, with my cousin. I just stopped to let him out for a moment. And what's really going on, you know, the the Unity Church that I went to last night, I was able to be with, uh, uh, I did Carl's, uh, uh, is it Carl Thompson? No, the light show that he does that you were talking about, that you said that you had experienced uh-huh. that before. And it was really fabulous because there were a lot of people that were there that you know, had joined together for um, raising the level of the vibration. And the show that he put on was just spectacular, just really awesome. And the vibrational energy, you know, and talking about it from that from that vibrational point, it was uh, it was great to be a part of that and to to experience the little sh- the shifts that I you know that are there and just to let people know that 
an hour before it was to begin, it was like my mind was coming up with every excuse and every reason. You know, oh, it's starting to rain. It's getting cold. What's the difference? No sense in doing this. It's like, oh, that's my mind. And this was something I'd been planning to do. So I said, oh, gee whiz, oh, I did it. and came up with everything. And, of course, when I did it, and then I had the the new ex, had that experience of it. To me, that's you know that that's living in the present, or doing my best to live at the present with it. For the mind, always wants to come up with a reason and a justification to keep it from doing whatever that it, you know, it's, it's it's so amazing, so amazing. You know, I was uh, thinking about when I was journaling the other day that. The, the challenge that I have, and as you talk about doing the work for a while with them, it's like there's a, it um, um, seems like, well, shouldn't I be finished with this? And as I was writing the other day about and making goals and setting goals for that particular day, it occurred to me that one of the reasons I think that, that people stop really dreaming, living their dream, or visualizing or desiring and creating things is because as soon as that happens, well, then, you know, the things get opened up, uh, all of the files get opened up around all of the incomplete goals and all of those energies that are on it, and it just uh, it just really takes away from the enthusiasm, that level of enthusiasm. So I'm here in Louisville and participating, and uh, nice to nice to hear some feedback from people and some different changes and shifts that they were making. So that's what's going on here in Louisville. I'm sitting here with my cousin Terry. Working on bloodline. Are you there? I may have lost you. Oh, excuse me. I, I had my mute button on that time. Ah. Uh, Hello, okay. Terry. Welcome Hello. to the show. Hello. How are you? I'm blessed. Doing well. Thank you. Having an awesome day here in the chilly Ozarks. It's cool and uh, and uh, looking like it might rain. Yeah, Cousin David just bought me a cup of coffee, and I used my card, and now i got a free cup of coffee coming. So thanks, cuz. <laughs> yeah, after so many, you get a free cup. Oh, uh, yeah. So he likes to he likes to razz me about that cause before I talk to him about the drinking of the coffee. So he likes to emphasize that, that he's, he's done that. So one of those things. Anyway. Awesome. Well, give me a shout after the show. i got a couple things to share with you. Okay, sounds good. All right. Anything else for you to share now, David? No, I'm just going to listen in. Did we get anybody uh, asking on the chat room or uh, any uh, uh, any questions out there, comments? No, it's fine. Go for it. Everything's quiet. Well, we would love to hear your thoughts, your questions. We've got about... Uh, 10 or 12 minutes left, call in number 646-200-4169. We would be delighted if you pick up the phone, ask us a question, make a comment, talk to us about what's on your mind around the idea of Aramaic forgiveness and going inside of yourself and changing the dynamics of your life. Jeannie, do you have any thoughts on any of the conversation we've been having? No, I'm good. Anything you'd like to share with us as we're getting ready to travel or share with our listening audience? No. Uh, we do have a Scott caller with their hand up. Awesome. Let's bring in the Skype caller. Welcome, Skype. Where are you calling from? Give us a name. Hello? Hello? Can you hear us? We can hear you, yes. Hello? I, you said don't hit one, so then they're not getting us. Um, are you acknowledging 541? Yes. Yes, ma'am, you're on. 
Julie. Okay, this is Julie and Julia. I thought this I heard Julie you. and Julia. Okay. Awesome. And we we're both the on the phone. Hi. We hey just there. went through quite a quite a quite a conversation, and and it was really intense, and we were. We were both a little bit in defense, fear, and hostility, and somehow miraculously we're more in love now. And I'm just, I'm just really wanting to thank you for your tools and um, the healing that you've made available or helped us learn from Jesus and the, and the Aramaic teachings. And Julia, do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, uh, is someone there listening? Yeah. Michael's there. I'm here, really, um, Julia. I'd like to hear your voice. I beg your pardon. No, what I what I said like was is voice. that. I beg your pardon. It's a delight to I, hear I, your voice. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Well, it's always delightful to hear yours. Um, well, yes, we have been through uh, something right here, which wasn't really very pleasant, but I felt a lot of judgment on the part of Julie, and uh, I think. Um, I think we've gone through it, but I, it's like I, I don't know how to say anything anymore, I, 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 and I don't even know why we're talking about it, except that it was a uh, an uncomfortable um, situation to be in, uh, where you couldn't really answer what you were saying because you felt that someone else was had their point of view and that you know it wasn't being heard. Well, and Hello? of course, Julia. If I have discomfort because someone has a different point of view than I do, then that's a piece of work that I get to do to clean up my discomfort. Now, my brain tells me that my discomfort is because of what they said and the fact that they have a different point of view. And my brain is a liar. It's lying to me. That's not why I'm experiencing discomfort. I'm experiencing the particular quality of discomfort that I have because that discomfort is within me. And the idea of the forgiveness tool is taking responsibility for that type of discomfort. I can now go in, now that I've discovered it in me, and say, ah, some discomfort I didn't even know I had. I think I'll go to work with the forgiveness tool, remove that discomfort, and reclaim my human life. And as I reclaim my human life, I reclaim the active presence of love in me. I get to live in a whole different game than the old game of discomfort. And it's not comfortable to get to that place. <laughs> because yeah, I have well, to face that what what I was what uh what I was experiencing is the judgment of a person rather than my knowing what I am experiencing and what I am at that moment. And uh, I don't think that uh, that someone else to judge it unless you have asked for that is, uh, seems appropriate to me because it is it, I experienced it as a form of attack, and yet they right. think that they're doing it as a favor to you uh, for you to um, see something that I am seeing, but uh, they're not acknowledging that I'm seeing. No. So then... Notice that you have a reality that because somebody doesn't agree with you, they're attacking you. Now, I'd offer, Julia, here's what that means. That would mean that when you don't agree with someone, you're attacking them. But you might not want to be quite so quick to judge that because they don't agree with you, that that is an attack. And to recognize that the discomfort you have around what you perceive to be attacked is a disintegrative energy that you could be taking responsibility for and saying, all right, I'm going to get rid of this discomfort in me. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to heal this discomfort in me and go back to experiencing myself in my pristine, brand new, newborn state. And then I'm going to come to this person who a moment ago I said was attacking me and I might see them at that moment in a totally and completely different light. There might be a whole different possibility and a whole different reality available at that moment. Does that make sense? 
Uh, it does, and I think that it's more or less come to that. But I think that uh, it was it was the um, presence of unasked for seeing this on someone else's part, which then is interpreting for me, which is my experience is very different, and um, and so that it, it was like a judgment, and that didn't feel comfortable. And so um, I guess the end result the end result is to finally say and accept what they're saying is what they're saying and what they're seeing and it doesn't necessarily is true but it takes away the sense of being attacked and uh, I can reclaim uh, more fully who I am that's I don't the know idea if that makes sense. To reclaim absolutely I'm in full agreement with you that's the idea is to reclaim your essence in a situation that otherwise you voluntarily give your essence up. They can't take it away from you. Whatever somebody else says cannot, I repeat, cannot cause discomfort in you. But if there is discomfort in you, someone else can say something that will bring that discomfort up. When it comes up, I can do one of two things. I can blame them because of what they said and they told me and they were this and they were that, or I can go, huh, how many times in my life have I been through and allowed this form of discomfort to occur in me? And am I willing to remove this form of discomfort and consciously, purposely, instead of blaming this situation, consciously, purposely remove discomfort and be in this situation where somebody doesn't agree with me, where somebody offers an unsolicited opinion, and I just stand in my original essence love as they offer me that opinion. And I can be in graciousness. I can be at peace as they offer me that instead of being in discomfort and disturbance. That's the power I would offer of a true human life is one who can be in the presence of someone who does things that are perhaps totally, completely off the mark. But because someone else does something that's totally, completely off the mark, that's no reason for me to have pain or discomfort. I'll have my own pain or discomfort because I have pain or discomfort. And I can use that as an opportunity to forgive that pain or discomfort. Is that making sense? Yeah. Awesome. Well, you reclaim who you are. That's it. That's it. And it's time for us to stop giving up who we are because of what somebody else, or pardon me, because we believe it's because of what somebody else says or does. Because we never give up who we are because of what somebody else says or does. We give up who we are because of what's inside of us that we haven't dealt with yet and that we refuse to deal with. Mhm. And in what what sense would you say that was? In recognizing who you are? Well, as I recognize, you know, hold a newborn child and you get the direct experience of who you are as a human being. Forgive what never belonged in you and you get to remove that which is unlike your newborn essence your true human life. And that forgiveness process, of course, you're familiar with. You were at the workshops where we presented the worksheet process and the how-to of forgiveness. And our show is down to about 20 seconds, so we're going to have to sign off. And if there are any other questions, uh, Julia, that you have, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys tomorrow on the show. And let's continue our conversation. Well, I think that's probably a good idea to... um, um, Take some time to yeah. digest it and uh, I'm going to and work with it. Have a blessed day and have the best Bye. year yet. Bye, Michael. Oh. Hi. Thank you. Are you there? Uh, we're gone. We're signed off. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife, Jeannie, who present that internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. 
Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. That's www.whyagain.com. Thank you.